The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Fluid Resuscitation for Burn Injuries by Dr. Robert Sheridan Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Shriners Hospitals for Children, Boston. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Warning! Some of the content of this video is extremely graphic as it depicts the injuries associated with severe burns. Viewers unfamiliar with such injuries may find this material disturbing. Hello, my name is Rob Sheridan and I work in the burn unit at the uh, Shriners Hospital in Boston. We'll talk briefly about the history of resuscitation. We'll talk about resuscitation physiology uh, very briefly and practically. We'll talk about resuscitation practice from a practical perspective looking at small, medium and large burns and a consensus resuscitation formula. We'll also talk about the colloid controversy. History. In terms of resuscitation history, uh, the uh, evolution of burn resuscitation has been sort of by punctuated equilibrium with uh, disasters and uh, wars uh, largely being the events that spur the development of new techniques and new, new uh, approaches. Uh, we'll talk about that as it relates to the Coconut Grove fire illustrated here. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of uh, Clifford Johnson, who was perhaps the most famous survivor of the Coconut Grove fire. And he uh, escaped from the uh, Coconut Grove, which was a nightclub that burned down in 1942 here in Boston with about 400 or more casualties. Uh, he uh, went back into the building to find his blind date, uh, who was already outside looking for him. And uh, he suffered a 40% burn in doing that. By the standards of the day, that was a lethal event with no probability of survival. There were no burn resuscitation formulas at that time. And he was placed into the care of a third year medical student named Philip Butler uh, as an ex basically an expectant patient. Um, and Philip uh, sat by the bedside with no resuscitation formulas to guide him and kept administering fluid at a, uh, a rapid rate uh, based on his uh, evaluation of Clifford Johnson's physiology. So he felt uh, Clifford Johnson was uh, dehydrated and gave him more and more fluid. And after 24 hours, instead of being dead of burn shock, as was expected of, of Mr. Johnson, uh, he was talking. And uh, during that interval, Philip Butler had administered 12 liters of fluid, which was, by the standards of the day, malpractice. Uh, but by the standards of the resuscitation formulas that would be later developed, it was really right on his predicted needs. In fact, the, uh, par the Parkland formula, which would be developed many decades later, uh, would predict almost exactly 12 liters as his needs. And uh, Philip Butler arrived at this just by uh, sitting at the bedside and evaluating the effects of all of his interventions, uh, really providing Mr. Johnson an individualized resuscitation, which is really the theme of this whole module, is that there's no formula that's going to tell you what to do. You need to be by the bedside and let your patient tell you what they need. Um, there's lots of equations out there, many of them based on uh, big egos and big units. Uh, and um, the other thing we're going to talk about later on is the colloid controversy. Resuscitation physiology. Resuscitation physiology, very briefly, uh, the physiology changes uh, as the resuscitation progresses during the first 24 hours. Uh, there's an initial hypodynamic phase, uh, largely driven by hypovolemia. There may, in very large injuries, be some myocardial depression, but that's unusual. Uh, and then there is a uh, hypodynamic phase driven by uh, fluid loss through the wounds and a big capillary leak. The capillary leak, uh, the genesis of this is not entirely known, uh, but it's graded with burn size. So the bigger and deeper the burn, uh, the more the diffuse capillary leak. So organ systems and uh, body parts that are not burned will swell. Uh, as uh, their capillaries leak in response to this physiology. And the job of the uh, resuscitator is to keep up with this loss so that intravascular volume stays uh, where it belongs. Uh, and there's formulas to guide us with this, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, in subsequent days after the capillary leak seals, 
uh, there are still some resuscitative needs for volume. There's still some loss through the wounds. Uh, there's resuscitative needs for electrolytes, and there's nutritional needs that need to be met. And these will change uh, over the course of the first few days after the injury. We'll talk about that briefly next. Uh, in terms of formulas, uh, the only uh, uh, characteristic that all of the many formulas share is essentially inaccuracy. If you plug the same patient into all the different formulas, you will get very divergent answers as to what the patient needs. And this really is a testament to the need for a quality resuscitation requiring an individualized approach based on the patient's response to the prior hour's fluid. And the reason for this is that there's many variables beyond burn size and weight uh, that uh, play into the, the, the fluid needs of the individual uh, patient, uh, the vapor transmission characteristics of that particular wound, uh, the presence of inhalation injury will increase uh, fluid needs, uh, the patient's baseline physiology uh, play a role, and um, the depth of the injury will play a role. So uh, there really is no possibility of predicting very accurately the individual patient needs. You just have to assess hourly your resuscitation endpoints. And we'll talk about those briefly in just a minute. Modified Brook Formula. Uh, a consensus formula, you gotta start someplace. And many people, myself included, will start with a modified Brook. Uh, formula here, which is uh, Ringer's lactate in adults and children greater than 20 kilos at 2 to 4 cc's per kilo per percent burn in the first 24 hours. The first half of that is administered in the first eight post-injury hours, not post-vascular access hours. Um, colloid uh, is generally not advised with the modified Brook. Having said that, this is an area of controversy, and if the patient has a large burn, uh, many practitioners, myself included, uh, would begin 5% albumin at a maintenance rate uh, and take uh, and subtract that volume from the Ringer's lactate rate initially uh, to help minimize uh, what's called fluid creep, which is uh, uh, a term that describes the increased amount of crystalloid that many burn patients will get uh, beyond formula predictions uh, to meet resuscitation endpoints in the absence of colloid use. And the only twist with children less than 20 kilos is the fear that they may develop hypoglycemia based on their inability to, uh, or their reduced uh, glycogen stores and the inability to produce glucose at a rapid enough rate. And uh, most people, myself included, would advise uh, giving 5% uh, uh, D5 ringers at a maintenance rate and take that out of the uh, resuscitation rate of ringers um, for kids who are less than 20 kilos. In the second 24 hours, this consensus formula would advise uh, uh, volume adequate to maintain a urine output on target of about one cc per kilo per hour for a child and a half cc per kilo per hour for an adult. And in the typical uh, mid to large uh, size burn, this ends up being about one and a half times a maintenance rate, typically at about 24 hours if the resuscitation has gone well. This can, uh, the type of fluid uh, that's optimal will vary. Uh, depending on what you're doing with the wound. Uh, in the first day when there's a large leak and there's large volumes of fluid going in, the patient's uh, electrolytes will assume the electrolytes of Ringer's lactate, 132 millicoulombs per liter of uh, sodium and uh, 3.2 of potassium. But uh, when those uh, Ringer's infusion rates go down, uh, the wound will start to influence what's going on with the serum electrolytes. If you use an aqueous topical, for example, uh, uh, silver nitrate, which is half percent uh, silver nitrate in distilled water, you'll leach a lot of electrolytes out of the wound, uh, and you'll need to continue to administer isotonic crystalloid to maintain a normal uh, serum sodium. If you use a non-aqueous topical like uh, silvadine cream, you get a lot of free water loss, and if you don't start to administer free water about that time, you'll start to drive the serum sodium high. And the, uh, the lesson here is uh, carefully monitor serum sodium, be aware of what your wound management is going to do to your serum electrolytes, and uh, anticipate that uh, with your fluid administration in the second 24 hours. Colloid, again, an area of controversy. Um, there are graded amounts of colloid that have been recommended by the modified Brook formula, and they're shown in your slide here. Um, and my own practice has been, if the uh, patient has a large injury, 30, 40 percent or greater, to administer a 5 percent albumin at a maintenance rate, uh, really beginning uh, when I start to start the resuscitation.
Nutritional support, part of the resuscitation, ideally should begin very early, and you can usually start this at a low rate in most patients enterally, coincident uh, with their initial fluid resuscitation, uh, as long as you have good hemodynamic stability and you're not using uh, uh, vasopressors, most patients will tolerate that. Small burn resuscitation. So in terms of practice, uh, from a practical perspective, uh, if we want to look at uh, burn resuscitation in small, medium, and large burns, uh, for small burns, 15% or less, maybe even 20% and less if it's not deep, um, I, many people would advise not using a formula, and I would be one of those people. Uh, my uh, practice is to provide a 1.5 times calculated maintenance rate as total fluid input and I watch the status of their hydration very closely. I'll, if it's a small child, I'll weigh their diapers or I'll watch their urine output if there's a Foley catheter been placed. I'll do a physical exam for the quality of their peripheral pulse relative to the quality of their femoral pulse. And if they have a nice full peripheral pulse, warm extremities, and a reasonable output by uh, weighed diapers and a nice uh, moist oral mucosa, and then they're, they're, they're gonna be okay. And uh, more uh, calculation is not necessary. Uh, excuse me, what type fluid, if it's a small child, I would give one times the maintenance rate of D5 ringers and a half times the maintenance rate of just plain ringers and, you, and use that as my uh, initial resuscitation fluid. And then as the as we near 24 hours and the child looks well hydrated, I dial that um, ringers lactate down uh, to, uh, to off and leave them on the D5 ringers and then start uh, enteral feeds or POs. Uh, in in um, small burns, you can sometimes do an enteral resuscitation, especially in uh, burns less than 10%. Many of those patients will do very well just with uh, careful observation of the status of their hydration and enteral feeds, uh, tube feeds, bottle feeds, as illustrated here. Uh, and in uh, de the developing world, and, uh, oftentimes where a vascular access is difficult to maintain, uh, just a feeding tube with some uh, resuscitation, who resuscitation fluid, uh, will work well to resuscitate burns, and there's been some great work done with that um, uh, by many uh, authors uh, using uh, enteral uh, resuscitation for smaller injuries. Large burn resuscitation. As burns get bigger, uh, greater than 20 percent, um, I think most people would begin to calculate a resuscitation and provide that as illustrated with the uh, consensus resuscitation formula that we started with. Um, and again, close observation is key. Uh, being able to really tightly monitor the urine output is important. Uh, if you have the uh, ability to measure base deficit, uh, serum and uh, uh, the serum pH, that is very useful as well. And again, physical exam is probably uh, your most important uh, neglected um, uh, monitoring tool, uh, monitoring the quality of the peripheral pulses, the perfusion of the extremities is very useful. Colloid, again, it's a controversial area. In the first 24 hours, uh, my own practice has evolved over the years so that I uh, would uh, routinely use 5% albumin at a maintenance rate in anyone with a burn over about 30 or 40 percent. And I find that that helps me to uh, vastly reduce uh, my, my crystalloid infusions, and I get less uh, uh, morbidity uh, related to edema. I'm not sure there's any ultimate long-term outcome benefit but the patients seem to be easier to manage, especially small children if they're not intubated and you're trying to uh, avoid airway edema that would require intubation. Uh, that does seem to, in, anecdotally, at least in my practice, to help. Uh, as burns get larger, 50, 60, 70, or greater percent, a calculated resuscitation is important. Uh, I uh, provide colloid to all those patients uh, up front. And again, close observation is very important. Um, and uh, uh, again, urine output is your primary uh, point of observation, uh, in, and uh, serum, uh, as, uh, serum pH, uh, base deficit are useful, physical exam are useful. Uh, invasive monitoring is useful in selected patients, although not uh, generally available uh, to all units. Maintenance fluids. In subsequent days, uh, volume needs are not really resuscitative, but there are often patients particularly if they present late to you, uh, patients with chronic open wounds um, that will have some ongoing uh, exaggerated uh, volume needs over time. And this can become a difficult problem sometimes to 
uh, uh, predict what is the status of the intravascular volume of a given patient who might be febrile, might have a large open wound that's losing fluid, and those patients have volume, electrolyte, nutritional needs, and I think um, my own practice in patients like this is to provide about one and a half times a uh, calculated uh, maintenance rate. Uh, I tend to make sure that they either are getting colloid or their serum albumin is within a reasonable range, perhaps over two uh, milligrams per deciliter. Uh, monitoring their electrolytes is important because these, there's a lot of electrolyte flux across a wound like this depending on what, how they're treated topically and they all have very exaggerated nutritional needs that you need to meet. And we'll talk about that as a separate issue uh, in a subsequent module, but paying attention to nutritional needs very early, right up front, uh, is important. If the patient is hemodynamically uh, controlled, they will almost always tolerate tube feeds very early. Granulating wounds. But just a one word about the very old wound and the, and the unique uh, fluid and, and electrolyte needs of patients with old granulating wounds like as, as are pictured here. Um, these patients will often, uh, as you uh, refeed them, if they're nutritionally depleted, have uh, exaggerated needs for potassium and phosphorus that you need to keep uh, uh, control of. Uh, they often have some exaggerated volume needs as well and uh, a lot of electrolyte flux across these wounds. And so monitoring patients like this, especially as you first uh, get them into your, your care, uh, and you start to change their fluid management and try to nutritionally replete them uh, to track those, uh, uh, those electrolyte changes is important. Conclusion. So what we've talked about very briefly is history of resuscitation. We've talked very briefly about practical aspects of physiology. Uh, we've tried to touch on a consensus formula and then uh, uh, usual practice as regards small, medium, and large burns for fluid resuscitation. And then the, and one other thing I just want to add and this uh, is that uh, if, you, if someone really needs a fluid resuscitation then they really need quality vascular access. You really can't compromise. And so if you have a small child with a mid-sized burn and you know to rely on one tenuous peripheral IV is probably not wise and this is a child who may very well need a central line to safely provide them the resuscitation that they need. Thank you. That concludes our video on fluid resuscitation for burn injuries. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.